today's topic I want to cover is basically websites then and now, but you know, it's, it's a complex subject, right? Because what I really wanted to convey to you guys and what I really wanted to reiterate was how things have changed, right? Over time and how those changes over time have affected all of us. It's affected everything and it's affecting the stuff that you guys are interacting with right now. Because when you go out there and you're pitching people and you're talking about stuff, people form opinions based on sort of obsolete paradigms that are past. And when we go back in time and we take a look at, you know, what's going on with websites, oops, let me just advance the slide here. When we go back and we take a look at what's going on back then, you know, just, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, which to some of you, it may sound like a really long time. Is I know that we have partners here who are, you know, in their 20s and 10 or 15 years ago is like a world ago to you. But for business owners, entrepreneurs, people that have businesses, it's not very long ago, right? It's not something that, um, let me see here, go back to full screen. There we go. It's not something that, um, that really was a long time ago, right? It was, it was not very long ago that websites were designed in a very archaic process, right? Sites were developed and I mean, there are sites 10 years ago built this way where they were being constructed by hand, right? We used to have storyboards. If you can imagine that, I don't know if any of you were involved in web development back then, but when you went to design a website, I was developing sites this way. You would actually have, you know, your big pad, you know, you'd get your pencil, your pen, your marker, and you would literally sit with the client and draw out each page, right? It was a 10 page site. There were 10 images, right? You know, graphics that you produced in the real world. I'm not talking graphics that were made in Adobe. There was no Adobe. Well, there was Adobe, but it wasn't being used in that way, really. Um, so you had this archaic process, this slow process. We had no CMS systems back then, you know, none to speak of. There were content management systems, even from the mid nineties onwards, but nobody could afford them. Um, you know, I remember I had a friend and he ran a news site. He, he spent, I believe it was Thirty-three or thirty-four thousand dollars for a custom CMS to be implemented, and his site did a lot less than WordPress 1.0. Right? It wasn't even at that level. It was incredibly crude, but it allowed him to have like a few authors post on the site and have their articles come up with no graphics at all. Um, you know, and this kind of a thing was normal, right? It was normal. We had really awful graphics. It was a really clunky really bad process back then. You know, we were dealing with a process that had so, so far behind what we have today. It's incredible. Um, you know, of course, there was limited code choice. It was like HTML, you know, 1.0 through 3.0, you know, very, very crude stuff. And if you understand programming, there were many features that we take for granted today that were like high-end features, like having a forum website was kind of like out of the question. That was all you know, the Usenet or that was all, you know, on a, you know, that was not normal. Having a forum on your website, just a forum that people could submit information on, that was impossible. So everybody worked via email. And because we all worked via email, everybody was getting spammed and there was no ICANN spam act. So the spam just was relentless and it bogged down networks and it was just terrible. Uh, databases existed, but they were of course offline. You know, if you guys remember that, remember what it was like back then, you know, we had Database systems, you know, it was like FileMaker Pro was kind of the only thing that the mid-market could sort of afford. You know, there are a few other options out there. You know, there were certain sort of low-cost, um, you know, options that existed, but they weren't, by low-cost, we mean $10,000, right? So this was kind of how it ran. There was no PHP, no Linux, no Apache web server, no MySQL. There was none of this stuff, none of it. So... That was the website paradigm that we all that came before the, the era that we're in now, you know, in various derivations thereof. Of course, things improved in a hodgepodge manner slowly over time. You know, things sort of evolved. Um, I would even count early WordPress in this back then model, right? What it was like back then, back in the day, because early WordPress was not very user friendly. It still is not word. It still isn't user friendly, really. Um, there were lots of systems then that weren't. And a lot of systems came along and then they died out. 
you know, WordPress was one of many uh, content management systems that it won the, the kind of the proverbial horse race. But back then there was PHP Nuke, there was Post Nuke, there were just a whole lot of different systems that were competing and they were clunky. Now, this had some lasting after effects. And this is kind of where we find ourselves today because when we go out there in the field, when you talk to people about getting a site developed, what do you hear all the time? You know, it's, I mean, you, you don't so much hear it directly as you sense it and you feel it. They're scared of process because if you've been put through a horrible process, it's like kind of like if you went to the doctor and every time you went there, he lopped a limb off, you know, or something crazy. You know, uh, if every time you, you had an interaction with somebody, it was negative, you're going to develop a negative sort of mentality about it. And that's kind of what happened with web development, right? A lot of business owners developed a negative um, overall outlook upon getting a site developed. We are dealing with this now, right? That's something that we, we deal with. Then we have these legacy websites that are, we run into all the time. And I know you guys run into them because I see them come through the system. Sites that are built in Flash, sites that are not mobile at all, absolutely horrible horrible aesthetics choices you know sites that are like hot pink mixed with brown with you know bright neon colors and flashing things that are like you know designed to give people an epileptic fit you know all kinds of stuff like that we see that kind of design aesthetics still out there um i wish it was all gone but you still run into it you run into really um cludged together websites with lots of very clunky designs and this came from limitations. A lot of that came out of limitations that existed in the past that are no longer relevant, right? We don't live in an era where there's pretty much any design limitation. There are some, right? You know, there's always something that limits you, but we don't live in a time period where there's tremendous design limitations. One of the major after effects though are tons of bad sites lingering online, which is a blessing for us, right? It's great. It's wonderful that sites in the past were not built in an upgradable manner. If they were, we'd have a real tough time um, selling. We wouldn't have a real tough time. We have a great platform. Everything's good with us. But you'd have a tougher time, right? If you had to, every time you were dealing with a site, you were dealing with somebody who had a site that was up to date, it would definitely not be as easy as it is because you'd run into those situations where people have the site and it's just upgrading. You know, it's upgrading itself. Now, the greatest thing that came out of that era, good and bad, was a profusion, an absolute explosion in different web technologies. I mean, stuff like uh, you know, JavaScript, Adobe Air. I mean, of course, you could say Flash, HTML5. You know, All these great technologies have their basis in solving the problems of yesterday. All the solutions of today exist and exist in the way they exist because they're here to solve problems that existed, you know, back then, right? That's just the way that it works. So the after effects are, are not necessarily bad things. Now, let's talk about websites now. Let's, let's fast forward a little bit because I think, you know, I kind of covered websites back then and that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to just talk, give you guys the, the ground floor base of this is all, you know, we're talking about what happened in the past. Now, websites now, Things are changing dramatically and they've been changing for years and we're seeing really cool stuff. We're a part of it, right? Because the sites we sell are cloud-based, right? They're software as a service, cloud-based. They're, they're built in instances, right? Meaning that the website is no longer its, its own individual little instance on a computer than, that, that's tied to that computer, that hard drive, that CPU, that system. No, now it's cloud-based, right? It's a whole network of computers that exist all over the planet. It's a interconnected piece of basically software that's running on live on many, many databases. And each website is an instance within that system. It's served up from the cloud. The user gets to gets their site built for them in that, in that system. And then it's broken up all over the world, mirrored everywhere, and it's served from a CDN served from Amazon servers, and it does a really, really, really good job. Now, we have wonderful CMS systems, and you can count our system as one of them, right? It's a content management system. It is. Um, although it's not just a content management system, we now have, even if you, even though I'm not a big fan of it, 
WordPress is today a good content management system. You can't deny that. Drupal is a good content management system. And my definition of good in any system is a system that can, when properly administrated, deliver outstanding results for the, for the person who is paying for it, right? Can be secure, can be safe. Is it safe? Is it secure? Is it outstanding? In most cases, no, it's not. But we now today, to contrast with yesteryear, we have content management systems that do a really good job. They do a really good job in terms of features, in terms of bang for the buck, that you cannot beat them anymore. Um, you know, nobody is buying custom CMS systems from developers. No one's spending 50, 60, 70,000 on a website, except, you know, certain institutions and government, they'll spend that. But nobody in the private sector, no normal business person or entrepreneur or individual is going out and just wantonly burning their money to get a website. It's just not happening. The sites that are being developed now that are even in that range are all e-commerce sites and they're worth every last penny. And I'm going to cover that in this webinar because I just did a video on this. I want to clue you guys into something. Multi-platform. You know, now we have sites that serve to mobile, sites that serve to um, all different types of devices. I mean, now we're, we're getting into sites that are going to be coming down the line, and I'll talk a little bit about what's coming down the line, but we're getting into, even right now, sites that are served for HDTVs, for 4K displays, for 2K displays, for smartphones, for, you know, watches. Um, we now have so much technology and so many platforms, and the way that sites are able to just effortlessly serve themselves up to all these different platforms, giving dynamic user experiences, are tied into databases. They, they've grown so much in their technical complexity and underpinnings that it's it's astronomically different. Sites are extensible now, right? In the past, biggest problem that you had with websites, one of the big ones was you would build somebody a site. I remember I built a website for a client and they spent, I believe, $6,000, right? So they spent not a huge amount of money, but you know, it was, it was a site that it was actually kind of a small site back then. I think it was maybe eight pages, but they spent about 6000 They came back and in the site that they had developed, they built it all in Flash. Go to, go to, you know, restart development on that, and it's a nightmare. You know, it's not happening. It's an absolute nightmare to go back and to start, you know, doing what needed to be done. So, that kind of thing is no longer happening, right? Because we're not building sites in Flash. Sites are being developed in, you know, in platforms and in manner that is much, much easier for us to go back and to, um, to work on. Future-proofing. This is huge, guys. Huge, huge, huge thing that's happened and it's really come down the line is future-proofing of websites. Sites now are developed in a way that, you know, especially like our sites where... The client could come back in five years, right? And the site is just as modern in five years as it was the day it was made because all the patches, all the upgrades, all the, you know, virus protection and definitions, all the plugins that will be added, we just roll features out and they just pop up and populate. That's the beauty of the cloud SaaS model. That is our, you know, current paradigm. That's our current paradigm. And it's very important to consider that, to understand that because... When you look at what, you know, what sites were like, and a lot, the reason I'm talking to you about this is because you're running into this stuff all the time. I know you guys are where you're out there in the field and you're running into websites that, you know, were built five years ago or, you know, even more, longer. And, you know, you guys will come back sometimes with clients saying, hey, can we fix it? And it's like, yeah, we can destroy it and rebuild it. That's fixing it because that's all we can do. We can't take, we grab the content from old sites all the time. Very, it's a very easy process. Most of the time, when we're building sites, guys, just to clue you guys in, I know we have some new people on this call. Most website deals are very simple, easy, straightforward things where you have a client, they've got, say, an eight page site. They developed all this content, all these graphics, and all this stuff, and the website's just obsolete. It can't be, you know, upgraded anymore on the platform. They don't like their host. They don't like the company that built it. They want a new site. So in those cases, right, most of the time, we'll 
we'll work it out where we're basically migrating the written text and the graphics from the old site and putting it into a new website that's being built gorgeous with a new theme and, you know, upgraded graphics and stuff like that. But we're just taking the written content and migrating it over. Now, we don't do migration ourselves. That would be your job, you know, to grab the content, put it into Word documents. And obviously, I've done videos on that. It's your responsibility to get us the content. But it's an incredibly simple process of literally copy, paste, copy, paste. And that is the modern paradigm. Very simple to do this. Now, moving on from here, I went through some of this stuff. I'm sorry, guys, I didn't even realize this, but I'll go through some of these. You know, the mobile web, one of the main things of now, a huge difference is the mobile web. When you talk about what we're going through these days, the mobile web is, uh, it's a huge, huge change. If you think about what we've gone through in the past and what we're going through now, and like I said, it's a marvel that sites are able to be developed in a way like the way we develop them where, you know, it's just they effortlessly load on all these different platforms and they have no problem whatsoever doing it. I mean, you're talking multiple OSs, multiple browsers, thousands of different devices with different size screens. And the website just loads and does fine on all that stuff. And it does it 24-7 from a cloud with huge security, with huge reliability. It really is a marvel. You know, we have a lot of design options. Design options of today are tremendous. We have so many options. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have really, and I think most of you have were on this call, but really spent the time just to study our platform, to study what it is that you've got at your disposal. I mean, you have at your disposal tremendous amounts of capability in terms of what you can offer to clients even relative to full-blown design houses, you know, we develop, we, we start with themes and templates, right? You know, but the way that we work is that's just like a framework. It's like an, every artist, you know, goes to, to paint something starts with a canvas, right? They don't start with a plant to grind it into the shape of a square, right? They start somewhere. And I like to think of our, of our um, you know, themes and templates like a canvas. It's an artist canvas. We start with something that's a real crude approximation of what the client wants. And then we go through a process of refinement where we take that and we work this, uh, this design and we go through drafts and iterations until we get to something that the end clients are very happy with. That's our standard process. But within that process, we have so many options, you know, uh, sites, of course, can still be complex. And this brings me to a really important point, something I wanted to cover just for general consideration, and that is e-commerce and quoting. Something that um, it's happened with some people uh, recently, and it's an important topic to cover. Um, when you guys go out there in the field and you encounter a client and you sit down and you start to discuss e-commerce with them, right? You have to get the budget to, to make sure you're not wasting everybody's time. And that's about as blunt as I can put it because here's the deal. E-commerce sites are dramatically more expensive than standard sites, dramatically so. And there's a reason for that because with e-commerce sites, we have to sometimes put in hundreds of products, right? We need to know how many products are going into that e-com site. It, and a standard e-commerce sites, it's almost almost impossible that we get less than this, people will come back with like 50 products. Some people get confused about what a product is, right? I'm wearing a hat on my head, right? This hat is, I don't know, beige or something, khaki color, right? But if I were to put this product into an e-commerce store, let's say that there were five colors of the hat and there were four images of the hat in each color, right? So now it's not one product, the hat, it's five different colors of the hat times whatever, four images, right? So now it's like 20, it's 25, right? So we have 25 images that need to be placed. And we have descriptions for five different hats. We have, so you can see how with e-commerce, things are much more complex than standard sites. There's a lot more work that has to go into putting each product up there, each graphic, each description, proofing it all out, making sure everything's bulletproof. There's a lot of work. And e-com sites um, commensurately cost a lot more money. They are not, uh, you know, something cheap. 
what happens a lot of the time, guys, is you'll go out there in the field, you'll sit down with a business owner and they have absolutely no technical knowledge whatsoever. To them, the e-commerce site that, you know, but like to them, Facebook is the same as their website, for example, right? They don't differentiate that one might cost more than the other or that one is even more complex than the other. So they're not going to understand it. You must understand it. Ecom site is like a million moving parts more complicated behind the scenes than a standard website. You know, databases, products, security, all that stuff is just ramped up. So... What you need to do when you're going to even bother getting an e-commerce quote is make sure there's a budget there before you even submit, right? Because you sit down with a client, you know, prospect, and you're out there in the field and you're talking to them and they're like, sure, I'd like an e-commerce site. Why not? You know, they have no idea what they're talking about. You need to go and say, okay, so you're interested in an e-commerce site. Well, that's great. What's your budget? You just ask them point blank. So they say, budget, I don't know, $400? You could say, yeah, well, you know what? That's nice, but that's really not going to cut it for an e-commerce site. I'm really sorry, but that is way below the minimum budget for you know, a website built with this technology. And you're not being rude, but you have to throw that out there. You must handle it that way. You cannot go and just push a quote through because... Think about it. You're not going to get the sale. There's no way that's going to happen. And you just generated a quote wasting your own time and their time when you could have moved on to another prospect that's viable. Little point, but a point I wanted to pause and make here because it's something that you know we've seen happen. And we will be posting a video basically to the effect of what I just said here in the near future inside the back office. So expect to see it up there. Video is emerging as a major technology. We all know that. Video has exploded. You know, YouTube it now accounts, I believe it's for 70% of all video viewed online now is going through YouTube. YouTube is like far, far, far outpacing cable television. Like I think it was, if you took every single cable news network combined, they're about equal to certain people's podcasts now. It's incredible. It is really insane when you look at the numbers, just the raw numbers of people that are reached by podcasts small channels that are niche specific that I've never even heard of, or you probably haven't either, have audiences now that are way, way above most shows on TV. So this is really transformative. In terms of websites, this has a major impact because sites, you know, as you know, they're conduits for video. And of course, your clients that you're running into, more, more and increasingly, we're seeing clients that are interested in video, in either putting video on their site or having their podcasts syndicate to sites or having their YouTube channels on their sites. We're running into entrepreneurs that are taking advantage of this and that are you know, getting more heavily involved. E-commerce is basically decimating retail. I mean, it's not just Amazon. It's e-commerce generally, but Amazon specifically, of course, decimating retail. You know, you can go on amazon.com and buy a 16 pound bag of dog food for $8 delivered to your door. Real literally go up to your post office and try to ship a 16 pound item and it's going to be more than $8. So when you have situations like that, you know, it's a no brainer. It's going to cause economic damage and you're seeing that and it's affecting with websites. It's really coming around to where you're seeing the type of e-commerce sites that we develop and stuff are e-commerce sites that are much more niche specific. And you're seeing this empower smaller businesses because they can't compete in retail space, but they can go online and they can compete. And you're seeing that happen as well. That's been a trend for quite some time, but you know, small manufacturers, um, certain niche specific businesses of different types, different kind of pro bespoke products, custom products, you're starting to see that more and more. And then, of course, automation everywhere and websites playing a key role in that. Now let's talk just for a moment and talk to you guys about websites of the future. And this is where it's interesting to me, at least to me anyway. Because if you read and you research sites, you really get into websites and what they're going to be like. Websites, the, the concept of a site, right, being this personal space of business A or B or C online, that concept itself is transforming, right? We're, we're seeing this less and less. That concept of it being this static thing, this parked piece of real estate is going away. Sites are going to be AI-driven. Now, the term AI, a lot of people, you know, have 
sort of confused mental pictures of what AI really is. People automatically go to like the Terminator or, you know, something like that. And that's, that has nothing to do with it. What we're really talking about is the ability for the site to pattern match and then parse databases. So that site, if you browse to it, is going to, and you can see this happening now with, with the big platforms, whatever the big platforms are doing now, you can expect you'll be doing in a few years. When you can see with big platforms, they're looking at pattern matching and recognizing exactly what people are doing, right? What, you know, what ads you've been looking at, what videos you've been looking at, what are you, what are, what ads are going to appeal to you the most? They're making decisions. In the future, it's going to be much, much more preemptive in absolutely all ways. So you're going to see websites that are going to preemptively know what you are going to do based on what you've done in the past, based on pattern matching and you know near instantaneous analysis. And you're going to have sites that do things like chase you with ads. You browse a website, you click a link, you like a product, you're walking down the street and it's literally going to be that ad is going to chase you. It's going to follow you into the store. It's going to follow you uptown. It's going to follow you to work. That ad is going to pop up again and again and again in different forms, trying not to be offensive, but also trying to sell you something or get you to take an action. This AI-based process is going to extend to design. Sites are, even today, it's a very informed design process, right? If you went back to design processes of 30, 40, 50 years ago, not talking websites, but just general design practices. Um, you had all kinds of different approaches, right? Some were scientific, like Ogilvy and Mather, and then others were just sort of shooting from the hip. And there were people that did this like crazy that had ad campaigns and designs that had little or no research behind them. Well, when you're looking ahead at, at websites and how they're what they're going to look like and how they're going to function, you're going to be looking at sites that are the product of a very informed artificial intelligence based design process. And that sounds far fetched. However, it's really not. If you were to look at even themes right now, the themes right now are, are parsed and gone over and gone over and gone over to refine them using UI UX information and data. So really you could say, sites now are AI based in a sense. It's just in the future, you're going to have sites that are adaptive. They can literally reconfigure themselves based upon the knowledge and, and deep intuition about who exactly is viewing them, right? Because people browse sites differently. People who are lefties versus righties, you know, with their hand, hand dominance, um, look at sites in a very different way in the sense of how they the menu is orientated on the screen, right? It can be, you know, what can be convenient for one person can be difficult for another. Different types of menus, different color schemes. All this stuff is going to be up for grabs in the future, in the very near future. Everything, all sites are going to be SaaS cloud-based. Even sites and technologies you think are not are eventually going to succumb to this, right? Because a lot of people tell me I'm crazy. They'll say, oh, no, there's facilities filled with computers. What's going to happen to them? I'm gonna, and I tell them, they're going to go to the dump just like all the 386s and 486s and old computers of the 90s. You know, a handful of closet basement geek people will restore them and play with them. And that's fine. That's cool. But the, you know, broad swath of industrial working servers that we have today are, you know, a generation, you know, they're, they're a, a newer generation of system. They're eventually going to get old and tired. They're going to be gone as well. So it's not like systems are going to hang around forever. And in the future, it's going to be absolutely uneconomical to have, you know, massive amounts of servers when a handful can do that job. You're going to see a return towards more centralization in terms of server space because it's going to make more and more and more sense to have singular systems with very, very high core counts and huge amounts of bandwidth on those singular systems. In a sense, you could say we're going back to the age of the mainframe, in a sense, but, you know, it's kind of more nuanced than that. Sites are going to be seamlessly upgradable. All websites are going to be something that gets upgraded, you know, 
on the fly like crazy. There's going to be no, no more of this, uh, you know, plug-in based websites and sites with patches. That stuff's going to be absolutely long gone in the very near future because all the plugins and stuff, although they may exist, are going to be auto patching onto the system. You're not going to have to have a person sit there and manually unpack zip files and grab stuff out to apply patches. It's crazy. It's crazy right now. It's going to be really crazy in five or 10 years. And, you know, the last thing that, that I think we all need to really pay attention to is the blended experiences of the future. We're going to be looking at sites that are, are offered up in a blended manner, right, where we're having much less distinction between our computer and the website or the one website and another area as everything blending together because of technologies like IoT and you know, or the Internet of Things and 5G and, and lots of stuff like that. It's going to empower websites to uh, perform more functions, do more things, offer more value, and at the same time do you know have that ability to um, form attachments in a sense um, to users. You know, and of course, there's a whole other side to this with people saying, hey, this is why we need way more emphasis on privacy rights and so on. And, and I, for one, agree. I think we do need more emphasis on privacy rights. But either way, this is the future. This is how sites are going to evolve. Now, I wanted to step back from this. And I had some sites, some stats and things that I found today that I wanted to show to you guys. A bunch of different links, right? I have Wikipedia's website. I think everybody should go and just take a view of this. If this subject interests you at all, you want to learn about sites and you want to learn some of the more broad truths about sites, you know, how they're structured and, and so on, that's a great, you know, URL. It's a great um, site for you to take a look at. And the same for HTML. You know, the evolution of HTML has been something that uh, has gone on my entire lifetime. And it's been, a, it's been a trip how it's changed so much. So here's Wikipedia on HTML and then Adobe Flash. A lot of people have asked me about this. I sometimes get questions. I don't read out loud about it, um, you know, about what happened to Flash, how did it go down and stuff like that. And there's a, there's a whole history there and I'll paste it in here for you guys. You know, there's a whole history, the rise and fall of Flash and, uh, it's a it's a complex, nuanced story. Flash, you know, its rise to prominence and its fall. You know, it offered some things in its day that were futuristic at the time. It was a very easy design process building flash sites. Flash site development lent itself much more to an artistic design process in many ways. And you could also use Flash for doing things like making cartoons and whatnot. It was used for more than just websites. It could do a lot because it was essentially, it's just vector elements that can be animated. And, uh, you know, it really fell down with the whole advent of, you know, sites that were dynamic and database driven and CMS system driven. And it really couldn't keep up because it's a static thing. It's a static website. Flash elements are like executable files, right? In the end, it doesn't have a database. It doesn't have anything that lives behind it. So it's kind of almost like a parlor trick of a site in a sense. So definitely not something that was going to last a very long time. I want to bring you guys up some interesting stats. These were some sites that I found when I started looking for statistics. I found a bunch of statistics. This one from Conversion XL is really interesting. How about halfway down, well, about a quarter of the way down the page, there's this part that says, first impressions are 94% design related. And this is about some research that was done by a British company where they looked into what impressions did people get of sites? And how long did it take them? It was about 12 milliseconds people formed their opinion. And when people looked at a site and judged whether it was garbage or great, only 6% of the feedback was about the actual content. There's very little, um, people were not looking much at content. I thought that was an amazing stat. If you keep um, scrolling down here, this, this goes into more and more statistics about sites and design. The reason I wanted to bring this up is, you know, I talked a lot about site design in the past, the present, and the future. It's something that everybody needs to pay attention to. You guys need to pay attention to it as well. When you look at a site for a client, 
when you start, you know, taking a look at a site, and this is another bunch of stats, and I'll paste this to you guys as well. I think it's important to uh, paste this to everybody. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Let me see here. Did you guys get this? Here we go. Okay. Copy some of this stuff. And now everybody should have this. I was pasting it just, there we go. Okay. When, when you guys are looking at, um, oh, I apologize, guys. My little friend here in the studio is barking. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, boy. All right, guys. Sorry about that. Um, when you're taking a look at these sites, though, and you're looking at exactly what they're doing, it's really, a, you know, an incredible uh, amount of it is design oriented. It is design focused. And it's something that nowadays, a lot of people don't, you know, people pay attention to design on sites, but they should even pay a lot more because sites are literally rise and fall on design. It's, it's everything. It's not something. It's not part of the equation. It is the equation. So when we look at sites and we go through these statistics, I just encourage you guys to really go through, take some time, you know, 0.5 seconds people take to decide whether a site is, you know, garbage or not. 57% of internet users say they wouldn't recommend a business that's poorly designed. 85% of adults think a company's website when viewed on a mobile device should be as good or better than the desktop site. These stats go on and on and on and really back up the case that design is a very important part of this. And I think as we go forward and we look at stats like these, you're really looking at a situation where sites are going to be very, very aesthetic driven, but at the same time, technically competent because they really do need to be both. And, you know, it's just something that I wanted to share with you guys. Anyhow, guys, I'm going to wrap up today's webinar. It was great speaking with all of you. Get out there, sell big guys, you know, go after the market. There's a lot of sales coming in. Lots of people are doing really well. And we're going to be coming out with some, some more news about the forthcoming upgrade of this whole program. It's going to be really exciting. I look forward to, uh, to showing it to everybody here and demoing it to all of you. Look forward to giving you guys some amazing new tools to help you sell. Anyhow, guys, I'll talk to you soon. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. <music>